and welcome to the Law School Toolbox Podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about overcoming disappointing grades. Your Law School Toolbox hosts are Allison Monahan and Lee Burgess. That's me. We're here to demystify the law school and early legal career experience, so you'll be the best law student and lawyer you can be. We're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, Bar Exam Toolbox, the Catapult Conference, and the Trebuchet Legal Career Site. Allison also runs the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review on iTunes. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can reach us via the contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com, and we'd love to hear from you. And with that, let's get started. Welcome back. Today, we're talking about recovering after getting disappointing grades in law school. We hope that when you got your grades, you jumped for joy. But the reality is that for most of you, you were probably disappointed by some or even all of your grades. And we're here to tell you it's okay and this is not really the end of your legal career. But if you were disappointed, you want to put a plan in place so you'll be set up for second semester success. Just remember, you've always got room for improvement. And, you know, both of us had some disappointing grades. I don't think anyone gets through law school without at least a couple of those sort of like, oh, ow, that hurt. (laughs) Lee, tell me a little bit about your experience with that. Yeah, mine, uh, my first experience with that was actually my very first grade that came in um, Mm. my 1L year, and it was in legal writing. And it was the lowest grade I might have almost ever gotten on a (laughs) transcript. (laughs) Ever. (laughs) Ever. And I was devastated because I considered myself a really good writer. You know, I don't mean to sound conceited, but I think most of us when we go to law school think we have some pretty decent writing skills. And I was devastated. I was actually visiting family in Ohio, and I was up late because of the time change. And um, so I got this grade, and I'm working on my aunt's computer, and I sat on the floor and cried. Oh, no. (laughs) That's basically it. (laughs) I know. I know, because I just felt so defeated, you know, because you've worked so hard, and you've been pushing yourself so much. Particularly for it to be the first one, it's harsh, too. It, it It was a harsh. I mean, things did get better after that. Um, well, but I think the story that you probably start telling yourself at that point is not a great one while you're waiting for the rest of your grades. Exactly. I mean, I think that's one of the things that's so hard about getting some disappointing grades is you it does really cause you to question um, this choice to go back to law school, especially I think if you've made the choice to leave a different career like I did and go to law school. Like a well-paid job. Yes. <laughs> yes. You start really wondering why, again, you're in debt uh, putting yourself through this experience. So yeah, it was rough. It was it was definitely cause for concern, and and it rattled me. What about you? When was your first uh, disappointing grade experience? Well, I mean, my first disappointing grade experience was actually the first grade I got too. But it, objectively speaking, it really should not have been a disappointing <laughs> grade. <laughs> um, but it was in my very favorite class, and like I really, really expected to get an A. And I only got an A minus, oh, which I know, <laughs> <horrible>. <laughs> which I know in this context sounds horrible. But, you know, I was actually, I was, I was not devastated, but I was like, oh man, how did that happen? I mean, this was obviously before I realized like <laughs> what the curve really means in law school. So how then, did you, know, you recover from that A minus? You know, were you well, crying you on know, the floor? <laughs> I was not crying on the floor. Um, I did sulk, I think, for a little while. Okay. Um, but then I got the rest of my grades and they were actually, frankly, better than expected. So um, <laughs> I'm probably the best person to talk to about bad first semester grades, although I will say... That just put even more pressure on me, and then I proceeded to have a complete breakdown afterwards. Um, And my second semester grades, objectively speaking, were much worse. Um, But to be honest, I was frankly just happy that I hadn't failed all my classes that semester. (laughs) So, um, you know, I think for me, it was just, I always looked at it as like, you know, the occasional like B or whatever, like wasn't going to kill me. So I didn't worry too much about it. But yeah, I didn't, I, I kind of avoided that experience of like the really terrible first semester grade coming in. But it just showed like how unrealistic my expectations were to begin with, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think that's one like, thing. That, that I would even think twice about like being disappointed by an A minus. Right. Like that's ridiculous. <laughs> and I think that's one of the things that is so shocking about this experience uh, when you enter law school is that you know grades feel like such a bigger deal um, that they did in undergrad, and then you've got the curve, which forces people to experience grades that maybe they've never experienced before just by the law of numbers. I mean, do you think this is really about the curve just kind of shocking everyone into this new reality? 
Well, I think a lot of, I mean, for me, like I, I did science classes as an undergrad. And so a lot of those classes were curved on a strict curve. So for me, like the worst grade I ever got in my life was in the second semester of organic chemistry. And I think that's like the only C it might even, honestly don't remember. It might've been a C minus. <laughs> <laughs> like it was the only like C I've ever gotten. And so that, but again, like that one, I was actually honestly just glad that I didn't fail the class. Um, but so I think, you know, I think if you have a science background, like you've gone through this like mm-hmm. harsh experience of like, suddenly you are not the smartest person in the room. There are a lot of other smart people. You're all being graded against each other. And so, you know, I think it gives you a little bit more perspective on like, oh, okay, you know, this is just, this is the curve. I mean, the reality is, you know, in your average first year class, we have a hundred people. They're probably handing out honestly, like less than five A's, you know, and that's not very many. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you no. know, for particularly for people who are used to this sort of grade inflated undergrad, you know, it's like something ridiculous at like the Ivy League schools, I think like half of the students get some sort of A in every class. It's like, that's uh-huh. not what happens in law school. So you're going to see grades on your transcript that you are probably not familiar with getting. Yeah. And I think the other reality is, like you said, um, a little bit like in the science classes, all of a sudden you weren't the smartest person in the room. I think a lot of people go to law school and you have to realize that you know, even if you went to a very accomplished undergrad, you know, you are now in a group of people who've self-selected to continue on to go to graduate school. I mean, most right, people like that the, choose to go to graduate school are pretty good at school. Right. You know, it's <laughs> so. like, yeah, great. You went to a great undergrad, but then like, you know, the top 10% of those people maybe are going to the top law schools, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's like, great. All those people who are like in your class, they're all like the best people in those classes. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of people just haven't ever experienced like this level of competition because frankly, you know, you can slide through a lot of undergraduate majors writing papers uh-huh. and like getting gold stars and everyone telling you you're really smart. But, you know, when you have a four hour time test and it's closed book and it's super high stakes and that's it, it's a lot harder to sort of bullshit your way through. For sure. I mean, I was a psychology and media studies major. I never took an exam like a law school exam in college. And I took some pretty hard classes, but they were it just it's not the same model. You know, you're not used to how pressure filled I think those that exam period is. And then the grades feel so much um, heavier because they're all just usually based on that one single final exam. Yeah. And the reality is like, you know, you're going to have a bad day some days or like your professor's going to be bad mood when they're grading it. Um, so, I mean, you know, odds are like most people are going to be somewhat disappointed. Mm hmm. I guess one thing to consider, too, is, you know, to really not take one disappointing grade and to inflate it into the whole experience, you know, because it isn't it isn't the end of the world. Well, and I think the thing, too, I mean, I think that's the case really with all grades, you know, like to some extent, sure, your grades can be an important marker of kind of how you're doing. And, you know, we know, for example, like lower grades are correlated with lower pass rates on the bar exam. Right. That's something to take seriously. However, like you are not your grades. You know, you are an, you are a person who has value independent of your grades. You can be a great lawyer if your grades are, you know, middle or below of the class. There's no real correlation, frankly, between like being a really good lawyer and getting excellent grades. Those are separate skill sets. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So what so, about like, class <laughs> rankings? Oh, yeah. I know the status here. And I know some amazing lawyers who were not at the top of their class i mean i, I mean they're, they're really just really separate skill sets course. like it's great if you can make good law school grades and like yes that helps you you know obviously employers look at grades you know if you want a firm job they're going to look at your grades carefully if you want a clerkship they're probably going to look at your grades carefully you were mentioning class ranking like this stuff matters i don't want to say it doesn't matter but it's not the be all and end all like there are other ways to be successful as a lawyer or even as a law student you know you can decide that okay not that you're giving up on your grades, but like, look, you know, this is not where I want to focus all of my time and energy. I'm going to do well enough that I need to get through, but I'm going to do, you know, multiple internships and mm-hmm. multiple externships. And I'm going to build relationships and I'm going to, you know, do these things that frankly are probably actually more important in some ways than like getting a slightly better grade. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. Um, I think some people who are new to law school may not really appreciate what the class ranking system is. I know that... It- and- and, like, some schools don't even rank. I mean, at Columbia, you know, everyone's a special snowflake, so we didn't have class ranks. In fact, we didn't even, we were not allowed to calculate our GPA. 
Wow, that's pretty amazing. But that, you know, that's not really the norm. That's only like your super, super fancy schools. Right. You know, a lot of different schools rank differently. Um, My school did it in percentages. So you could be in the top 5%, top 10%. They just did kind of like cutoffs. They didn't number rank you in the class. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I think sometimes depending on your school, depending on the types of employers you're looking at, ranking can matter. Um, But I think like anything else, it's just one thing on your transcript or on your resume amongst lots and lots of other things. So again, if you're worried about your class ranking and you're not really sure, you know, if you should write it on your resume or what you should do with it, you know, talk to your school, but just remember, it's not the only thing defining you and your law school success. Yeah, exactly. There are other ways that you can choose basically to define what you're going to take away from law school. And if it's great grades, fantastic. Like that'll get you a long way. But I mean, for example, like one of my law school roommates after the first semester literally didn't look at her grades. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, she I mean, she was like, I want to do public interest work. Like I'm going to get a job based on who I know and like what they respect for my abilities. And she had a friend look at them to make sure she hadn't failed any of her classes. But she's like, I don't care. It doesn't matter mm-hmm. to me. I don't even want to know. That's pretty awesome. That's great. Like self-awareness. Yeah, I thought it was really ballsy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was like, are you I was like, are you just curious? She's like, no, like what good can come of this? It's just gonna make me feel bad. Do you know I knew someone once who didn't check if they passed the bar for like weeks. Whoa, I just could that's not crazy. I just, there's no way. I mean, I was clicking refresh like at 559. For those of you who don't know, in California, bar results come out at 6 p.m. And so like literally like you're just sitting at the computer refreshing the page until you can type something in. It's it's very Oh awesome. God. Hold it um, don't, yeah. don't remind me. Um, yeah. So I mean I think I think the key takeaway here is like, yes, grades are important. I don't think any of us are gonna tell you that they're not. I think you should try to do as well as you can. And if you're in a situation where you're disappointed, I think it's really important to look at sort of what you can do. Um, and just as a side note, like, you know, like I was talking about, not all schools have class ranks. Not all schools even give grades, right? (laughs) I know. Yeah. Um, if there seems to be a movement away from grades, I think, especially at a lot of the elite universities, they, sometimes they do it for the entirety of your law school career. Sometimes they just do it for the first couple semesters, but there's a lot of, um, the high pass, pass, fail, um, options instead of grades, um, which, It's interesting because I think the intent is to not let people freak out about grades, but then they just freak out about why didn't they get a high pass versus a pass. Yeah, exactly. I don't think it really changes anything. I don't think it actually necessarily improves anything because people basically then are just, they're sorted into these like less granular categories. Yeah. So, you know, if you would have been like, say, a B plus student, you're now in like the pass category with someone who's like a B minus student. That's a pretty big difference. Yeah. So it's just kind of interesting um, how I, you have to wonder if, the results that they're getting from this move to be different is really helping anything. But. Well, I think it's just the reality that like, even if you're at Harvard, you know, you're still competing for like the top clerkship and that judge wants to see a bunch of high passes, not a bunch of passes. So, exactly. you know, it's like the reality is you can do whatever, you know, the school's going to do what they, whatever they want to try to sort of minimize it, how people feel about their grades or whatever. But the reality is like other people are still making decisions based in large part upon them. Agreed. Yeah. Okay, so whether you got a high pass, pass, fail, whether you got A's, B's, C's, or below's, um, you know, once you get your scores, if you are disappointed by what you saw, even if you're like Allison and were disappointed by your A minus, <laughs> you know, I really deserved an A. In you that really class deserved lead. an A. For Please, that A-. you have to. <laughs> the like, exam was too easy. Yeah. You should have given us a harder exam. Yeah. And I would have done better on it. <laughs> um, I think it's important to realize that it's okay to be upset because I think a lot of students, you know, try and skip that part of being disappointed. I mean, that's, that's part of, I think, making peace with things is to go ahead and like, you know, have your moment of disappointment. Just don't, um, just don't let it become, you know, a wallowing, uh, long, you know, I don't know what's the best way to describe it, but don't let it become something that can be like damaging to your experience but you want to give yourself I mean, Lee, like space. for you, you know, like i mean how long did you spend crying on the floor like I mean, a few minutes a day a week yeah no it was, it was like a day and then maybe i i called my dad for a pep talk the next day and then i then i think i overcame it <laughs> so <laughs> then you probably got some better grades you're like oh okay i'll forget about yeah that exactly more. get some better <laughs> grades and then i mean the moral of my story is i busted ass uh, on, in legal writing and ended up high scoring the class the next semester. So, I mean. Right. So, I mean, that's kind of the takeaway here, right? Like, this is not, it's not outcome determinative how you do first semester in terms of grades. Exactly. Exactly. So, the way, though, that you do something like that and change your 
path is you have to develop a plan um, and really put yourself out there. You know, calling back our one of our earliest podcasts where we talked about mindset. I think this is really where it comes into play because uh, this is when students contact us for help after disappointing grades. We see the two categories of the mindset. You know, the, yeah, definitely the fixed mindset of this means I'm not smart enough. You know, this is just how it is. I'm now going to be a bad law student. I shouldn't have gone to law school. Versus the growth mindset of I now have this mountain to climb and I need to figure out how I'm going to climb it. Yeah, and I mean, frankly, you know, we get a lot of emails, obviously, when first semester grades come out, and you can almost, you can almost tell like, the people are freaking out the most in certain ways, mm-hmm. or often the people that you know are not actually going to do anything about it. Yeah, because <laughs> um, they're looking for some sort of magic formula that's going to solve all of their problems, and the reality is like, look, it's a lot of hard work. Like that's how you overcome this. Exactly. You know, same thing with the bar exam. We're in bar exam season right now, and when people, you know, are like, well, what's the answer? the easy answer to passing the bar after failure. It's like, there is no easy answer. Yeah, like, sorry, that's not going to happen. If I had the easy answer, we would be the premier bar <laughs> provider <laughs> yeah, in the we, entire world. Yeah, we'd be charging, like, way more than we are. Exactly, exactly. So it, it does take a lot of hard work. And so the important thing is, you know, to get... And I think a lot of, like, reflection, too. It's not true. enough to just be like... Because sometimes I think people get their grades and, like, I never want to think about this again. Yeah. Like... I got this, like, it's just, I'm going to move on. I'm just going to move forward, which is like a very American response. Just move forward, like positive thinking. (laughs) But the reality is, you know, if nothing else, like you have actually a lot of information now that if you are willing to face that information head on and work with it, Mm -hmm. you can actually really accelerate your growth and accelerate, um, you know, ideally like your progress in a way that you can't if you're not willing to sort of sit with like what did I not do and really evaluate that or like what am I you know what am I doing poorly like why am I getting this grade that I don't think I should be getting you have to really figure out why that is it is and that's a process and that really takes I think that's a it's going to somewhat of a vulnerable place too which I think is very challenging because you know the law teaches us not to be vulnerable the, I yeah. think law school really tries to to push that part of us down um, yeah. a lot. Like you, sh- you should know everything. You should always have the answer. You should right. be quick on your feet. You should be ready to react. And this is kind of the opposite of that. It is the opposite. So it can take some time to process this information, but to get to that space where you are vulnerable and, and open to change, you know, and open to suggestions. And I think one of the hardest things for students to do are to actually really face some of these exams and you need to go try and contact your professors or the registrar, get copies of these exams if they're available and try and go meet with your professors to see what went wrong. It sounds awful, but it is really one of the very, very important steps to developing a plan so this doesn't repeat itself. Right. And I think sometimes, you know, I think one of the normal reactions to disappointing grades is you want to blame someone. So, you know, you want to blame the professor. They weren't a very good professor or they didn't treat you fairly or they didn't like you or whatever. But I mean, the reality is this is an anonymously graded test. Like, really, you know, your professor can think whatever they want yeah. about you. But when they were grading the test, they didn't know who you were. Um, and so I think, you know, you've got to basically take yeah. responsibility and, you know, you can blame it on the curve. You can blame it on all kinds of things. But I think if people find themselves sort of looking for someone to blame, that's probably a sign that you're not yet at that point of vulnerability and saying, okay, I'm going to take responsibility for this. I'm going to try to figure out what happened and make sure that it doesn't happen again. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, I'm going to have to get help. I'm going to have to get feedback. I'm going to have to go ask those tough questions, you know, to figure out what, what went wrong. Yeah. And go talk to some of these professors who can be somewhat intimidating um, and to really listen to their feedback, because I think it is easy to be angry at the professor <laughs> if you are disappointed. Well, in your you know, frankly, like a lot of them are really uncomfortable talking to students about their exams because they're not comfortable with like the strong emotional feelings either. And <laughs> right. they feel, you know, and they feel badly. Like you know, the professors are like they're people. They're like you know, the student was really nice and I liked them, and I feel bad like having to give them this grade that I know is going to be upsetting, and I really hope they don't come talk to me. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Right. But that doesn't so mean there's a way, know. I mean, let's talk about sort of how, how can someone approach their professor in a way that's likely to be productive? You know, I think um, you have to go in and, and think about kind of what you want to say, you know, and say that you want to review your exam and, and start asking questions. You know, what were the things that I could have improved on, but also maybe what were the things that um, I did well? Because I think a lot of people don't, one, give themselves the opportunity to hear anything positive, which is a mistake. Right. 
Um, but also then the professors kind of, you're throwing them a bone. They get to compliment you likely on something, which is going to make it an easier conversation and balance some of that, you know, the harder feedback with some some positive feedback. There's going to be something good in your exam that they can, can talk about. Uh, yeah. You know, but then I think you have to really listen to their feedback and um, and try and ask follow-up questions so you can really understand it. You know, for instance, one thing that we constantly hear from students is that their professors just said they were too conclusory. Mm-hmm. Um, and this seems to be like a secret professor word. Right. It's like, this is bad. Let's call it conclusory. <laughs> it's bad. It's conclusory. And I think so many students leave and they're like, so I was conclusory. And I'll be like, well, what does that mean? I don't know. Yeah. Or like, can you show me a specific example of where that right. was? And then they'll be like, so- no, I don't know. And so, you know, being conclusory typically means that you didn't, you know, dialogue about the facts, that you didn't really have enough analysis, that you didn't read re- you know, include counter arguments, things like that. But you need to follow up with the professor so you really understand what that comment means. Because you can't yeah. change anything if you don't actually understand the feedback. Yeah, and I think it's important before you go and talk to your professor to review any materials that they've given you. So if they've given you a sample exam, whether it's a student exam or whether it was one they wrote, you know, you shouldn't go in until you've really carefully looked at that and maybe made notes on it and sort of look, you know, highlighted things that you didn't do, that you, analysis you didn't do, um, and really try to figure out on your own what the problems were. But yeah, if you go in and they're like, yeah, you know, you're just, overall you're too conclusory or you didn't have enough analysis, you know, I think it's completely fine to say, look, um, you know, I hear what you're saying. I think that's probably true. Could you give me an example of where you think it's the case? Right. So that you can really walk away being like, oh, okay, you know, or, you know, you could ask, well, are there any places where I did a good job with this? Uh And they're like, oh, you know, well, here's a situation where you analyzed both sides of the argument and you made a conclusion. So this is a good example. But then here in the next paragraph, you know, you just jump to the end. So that's the sort of feedback ideally you're looking for. Exactly. Um, Now, one thing I think it's important to mention is if your professor did do a multiple choice question section, they're likely not going to let you see those questions again. Um, and they're not going to give you a copy of them, and they probably will not review them with you. <laughs> so. Right, because they're not going to rewrite them. But, I mean, if nothing else, like, you should be able to – typically they'll at least tell you, like, on the multiple choice section, mm-hmm. you know, you did or did not do very well. Yeah. And if the answer is you didn't do very well, it's like, well, you need to be practicing multiple choice questions because that's on the bar exam. Exactly. Um, and it's on, you know, typically a lot of other exams. So, you know, I think a lot of this is sort of like figuring out, like, oh, okay – I was above the mean on like this one essay, but below on this other one. And then the multiple choice, I totally bombed it. Yeah. So that's useful information. So once you get this feedback back from your professor, Alison, Why, what do you do if your professor just won't talk to you? Oh yeah. That's, that's terrible. Sometimes you just, you just give up. I mean, if a professor will not talk to you, I think it's because a lot of them won't, I mean, they won't let you take your exam answers with you either, which I think is kind of crazy. I do think that's kind of crazy. I mean, I think you just do what you can. You know, some professors are really on lockdown about this kind of stuff. I think it's the minority. Um, I think most professors will either let you see your exam answer in the room with them, talk to them about it. Even if yeah, they won't some of them will even let you take, they'll take photos of it, like I've heard, which doesn't make any sense, but no. whatever. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think just try your best and... Yeah, and I think look at other resources. Like if you have copies of your exam, your professor, for whatever reason, is not willing to talk to you about it, you know, was there a TA in the class you might be able to take out for coffee and get some feedback? Was there someone in like academic support who would look at it? You know, do you need to hire a tutor like us to look at it? Like once you have that exam, you can get feedback. For sure. But if if they won't let you have it, it's kind of a whole other story. Yeah. But it's highly unlikely all your professors are going to do that. So you're still going to be able to – and if you struggled with one thing – in one class, like being too conclusory, it's possible you struggled with that in the other classes too. <laughs> right. Yeah. And this is where I think you have to sort of look at, you know, a comparison too. Like, are you doing well in most of your classes? Or are you doing uniformly mediocre? Um, you know, because I mean, like we said, things happen. You get a question that you're just not that prepared for. You have a bad day. You know, you run out of time. Your computer crashes. But you have to really evaluate, I think, your entire study process. Um, and if you're getting sort of mediocre grades across the board... There are things that need to change in your study process. I completely agree. I think that's one of the mistakes people make is they think, well, I messed up around finals, so I'll just do final exam time differently. And I think that you're missing out on an opportunity to look at your entire study process, really starting with how you're preparing for class and how you're spending your time preparing for class. Are you actually doing activities that are going to help you now that you understand the end game? You know, right. Are You've you been through it? Yeah. 
Exactly. Are you reading three supplements before class? Like, well, are you not? I mean, a lot of people not reading, <laughs> not reading the cases. Yeah. Like, hmm, you didn't do so well on your exams. <laughs> Let me think of one thing that might help. Maybe you should do your reading. Exactly. But you know, it does really start with going back to the very beginning. And then, you know, when did you start outlining? Did you wait till the end? You know, should yeah. you be able to start outlining earlier? Should you start doing more practice? Could you get feedback on that practice? I mean, it really is, you know, starting with classes, starting up again, you know, in January or whenever they start, it is about looking at the entire semester. So when you get to exam time, you know, you have been preparing for exams from day one. Yeah, it's not like, yeah, you don't just need to be like, oh, you know, I should have done this one thing differently and everything magically would have been better. It's like, no, this is going to be a whole process. Uh And it's easy to start off strong and be like, yeah, I'm going to really focus. And then a few weeks in, you're kind of slacking off again. You're starting to fall behind, you know. Yeah, it's easy. (laughs) So I think a lot of this is scheduling and accountability, too. It is. I mean, I think that's one thing that people are not realistic about for semester is just the amount of sheer volume of work that they need to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And I think I like your point about accountability because I think, you know, you have to create your own accountability. But like even promising yourself that you're going to go to two office hours, you know, regular basis mm-hmm. to... I'm not just promising yourself. Put it on your calendar. Agreed. Like figure, figure out when each professor has office hours. Make that a recurring appointment on your calendar. And then, you know, keep a checklist of like when you did and did not go. Yep. And manage your time. If you feel like you didn't have enough hours in the day last semester to get everything done, you might be surprised if you start tracking your time. I think we talk about this in one of our other time management podcast, but tracking your time like a lawyer, really, you know, looking at your calendar, thinking about how you're spending your time. Are you watching TV shows in the library instead of working? Um, Yeah, I think, you know, I think basically for a lot of people, I mean, to be honest, like they just have to get serious. You know, like it sounds harsh, but the reality is like you didn't put in, in a lot of cases, like you didn't actually put in the time and effort required to do well. So it's not really that shocking that you didn't do well. Well, and I think I have to bring it up again because we were just talking about this over email this weekend um, about the issue with email and doing deep thinking tasks because this is something you and I both have to deal with (laughs) on a regular basis. Um, And I think this is a big thing for students is this idea that you really cannot do deep thinking tasks if you are being constantly interrupted. Right. It's just, it's it's impossible. Yeah, I mean, basically, if you're going to do a chunk of reading, it's so much more efficient, so much more productive to literally like cloister yourself off where you do not have distractions and do that reading for an hour and a half or two hours. Because every single time that you look up and you look at your phone and you switch to your email and you get a WhatsApp and you get a Facebook, it's just like every single time you do that, your brain has lost focus. And that's not how you learn. Yeah. So if that is another thing that you may want to evaluate, you know, were you able to, you know, shut off the distractions and give yourself that time to do those deep thinking tasks and really get the most out of your study time? Because I think for me, I mean, I struggle with it with work too. You know, you feel like you worked all day, but then the end of the day, you're like, man, I got nothing done. Like, how is that possible? You know, but I was at my laptop and I think law students feel the same way. I studied all day, but what did I actually get done? So yeah. And again, like, you know, also, like, are you taking enough breaks? You know, you, you can't study 12 hours a day every day. Like, it's just not possible. So if you're, you know, if you're burning out and it, you know, think about how you felt, like, by the end of exams or even at the beginning of exams, did you feel like you were fresh and ready mm-hmm. when you started the exam period? Or did you roll in, like, kind of sick, totally burned out, really exhausted, like, not that motivated? Yeah. Because that's something you can do something about this semester. So true. By being, you know, by blocking out exercise and time off and, you know, I think a lot of people would actually be more productive if they did that sort of thing I religiously. Agree. Yeah, I 100% agree. So th- there's a lot for you to think about, but once you get you know through the disappointment, to start really evaluating the entire process and setting up some new goals for yourself, I think can be really effective. And then use all the resources available to you at your school, TAs, academic support, professors. And then if you need outside help, people like tutors, um, you know, can also be a really effective way to help manage the study process. Right. And I think, you know, the important thing is like you have a choice about how you're going to react to this. You can try to stay positive. You can see this as a learning opportunity and you can really recommit to becoming a better law student. I mean, you can go listen to our podcast episode on mindset, which is one of our very earliest ones. Um, But, you know, this is this is definitely a challenging time, but it can be a growth opportunity. And you can look back and tell the funny story in a job interview of like, God, yeah, you're right. My first semester grades were really not very good. 
but I turned it around. Yeah. Or you can find yourself at the end of three years interviewing for a job being like, yeah, my grades all over were pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <You know? laughs> Hire me anyway, please. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, you, you know, you can spin one semester of bad first year grades. That's not a problem. Like, people get that. Yeah. But only if they see a market improvement afterwards. Yeah, 100%. And so let's shift a little bit to these other um, these other challenges that can come up second semester. I think people are worried about looking for a summer job, um, you know, or applying to other opportunities for 2L a year, like law review or moot court or things like that. Um, how do you handle bad grades and still move forward? Do, should you just not apply to things or? Well, I, mean, I think you have to be realistic, but you also have to understand that, like, you have an opportunity second semester to really do a lot better, mostly because a lot of other people will just kind of stop trying. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, for 1L summer jobs, the reality is most people were not going to get paid anyway. Right. You know, we, have a pod- we have a podcast on this, too. Um, <laughs> But, I mean, there are, you know, there are a lot of legal employers that actually really don't care that much about your grades as a 1L. You know, if you're interning, I mean, obviously you're not going to get, like, a large firm, like, $3,000 a week job, but you just need to do something that's legal. Um, And, you know, a lot of the public interest organizations or whatever, they're going to be like, okay, great, you're willing to come work for us. That sounds awesome. Um, So you should be looking broadly, you know? Yeah, I agree. And I think, um, again, remember that it's not just about these you know, small batch of grades, what it really comes down to is the entire arc of your story. You know, what is your story going to be? Is it going to be one of you took these grades and turned them into something else? Or if academics aren't going to be, you know, your focal your point, focal point <laughs> or if that's not where you're going to succeed, then get as much practical experience as you can. Or if you hey, want to be- join the I mean, you can even like look into things like doing moot court if you're more of a like, you know, orator than you are. Right, or advocacy competitions, you know, so you end up getting awards doing advocacy competitions. Yeah, there are ways to distinguish yourself outside of just writing an in-class exam. Exactly. And I think that's very important to remember. But again, be conscious about that and say, you know, what's my story going to be at the end? How can I show that I am successful at what I am choosing to do? And that's going to make you marketable. For yeah, jobs. And yeah, the reality is, I mean, obviously, it's a lot easier to get on to like the premier law review at your school if you have good grades. That's just the way it works. But it's not the only option. Typically, you generally have a writing competition that you can focus on. And you also have other journals. And again, like if another journal is a better part of your story then do that. Yep. Like, don't kill yourself over like, oh, I'm never getting on a law review. It's like, who cares? Yep. You know, if you want to do like IP law and there's a journal of IP law at your school and they're perfectly happy to have you go and be an editor, do that. Yep. And don't look back. Yeah, exactly. So what if you were one of the lucky people like Allison who got disappointing grades like an A- <laughs> in the first semester? Um, you know, I think it's important to not slack off. I mean, we hear the stories all the time of people who are so confident after their first semester and then second semester, they get a little cocky and then things. Well, or I mean, in my case, like I got clinically depressed because there was too much pressure to keep doing well. Okay. You know, yeah, so that's, it, that's, a, that's, a, that's an important <laughs> story too. <laughs> you know, it's not, I mean, I think, but that's sort of the thing is like people think like, oh, your life is perfect if you get great grades and like everything is laid out for you and you're totally great and like you're, you know, you have no problems, but that's just not the reality of it. No. Um, you know, I mean, you have equal pressure, if not more pressure. And you can't complain to anyone because who the hell wants to listen to you complain about an A minus? Exactly. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> You're not going to get a lot of sympathy. No, but I definitely, you know, I knew people who were at the top of the class and they thought, well, sweet, I got this. And yeah, you, I don't have to try. Right. But what you have to remember is, is that. Or like, I'm just good at it. I'm just good at this. I've proved I'm good at it. But it's like, no, you worked a lot and that's why you did well. Right. And then you have to remember, again, going back to this idea of the curve, everyone else is going to be a better law student. Two, they're all going, you know, a good chunk of that class who got those disappointing grades or were just right behind you, they're going to fight to knock you out of the top spots because yeah. they want those higher grades. And maybe they're going to take a lot of steps to become more competitive. So you also, if you want to stay at the top of your game, need to also work hard to remain competitive to keep those grades or you're going to get knocked out of your spot. No, I mean, it's definitely a good sign that you did well, but it's not like you can just slack off and show up without trying and do well again. It's not going to happen. No. I'm proof positive. My second semester grades were a lot worse. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, there probably are people also listening to this podcast who are thinking of transferring. And especially if you're doing well and you want to transfer, you better uh, make sure that 
your second semester grades remain stellar. So you have those opportunities to transfer. Yeah. Or there may be people who you know, are listening to this or thinking about dropping out. I mean, do we have any thoughts about that? I mean, that's a real tough one. But if you are considering that, I think it's worth spending time really contemplating it and either making a decision to do it or not do it. But don't waste the semester debating it because I think it, then you're just creating a self-fulfilling prophecy of not being successful. I don't know. What do you yeah. think? No, I think that's right. I think, I mean, if somebody wants to drop out of law school, you know, and they have a valid reason for that and they're not doing well, they're not liking it, great, drop out. But I agree. Like, you know, don't be like, oh, well, I can't really think. Like, maybe I should drop out. Maybe I'll just maybe I'll just see how the semester goes. It's like, I can tell you how that semester's going to go. <laughs> <you know? laughs> and then you're a year in and you have a year of bad grades and you've paid a year of tuition. Um, I think it's absolutely, you know, and you don't have to, you know, maybe it's take a leave of absence to think about it. But I think... Absolutely agree. If you're going to make that decision, make the decision sooner rather than later and either commit to going back to school and doing as well as you can or commit to doing something else. But don't like being in this limbo is not a great place to be. Agreed. And, you know, we work with folks who have, you know, are on academic probation or are trying to get readmitted after failing out of school and things like that. You, If you are worried you're going down that road, that route, you know, you want to make sure you take steps to either say, this is not what I want and I want to do something else, or I can see the handwriting on the wall that I might be going down this path. It is time for me to get help right now. Um, Yeah, it's not a good place to end up after the fact. It's definitely not. And it's much harder to come back from that situation than it is, you know, if you're, we see all this, I talk about the bar a lot because we're in bar season right now, but I see this so often. It's like people say, well, you know, I failed again because the second time I just, you know, I just tried the same thing as I did the first time and then it didn't work again. And it's like, well, now you've failed twice. That is such a worse position to be in. Yeah, it's not going to, it's not going to get any better. It's not going to get any better because now you have, you know, you have a mental, um, like mentally you're in much more of a challenging place because you have two failures under your belt. Uh, you spent money just like you would in law school, continuing on down a path that's not going to get you where you need to be. And so it's time to decide to do the hard work now so you don't end up in one of these avoidable situations where you could yeah. be in real academic trouble. Yeah, and it's much better you know, to take a semester off than to have another crappy semester and have to deal with the outcome of that. For sure. Um, I think that my last thing I would say about that is, you know, sometimes professors will call out that they think that you could be uh, struggling with a learning disability. Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes stuff comes up in law school that has never come up before. (laughs) Like, um, I have a lot of students that I know who've been diagnosed with ADHD during law school um, and other learning disabilities. I think just the pressure cooker of the law school experience really um, brings these issues up. But again, don't ignore them. You know, if you think that that could be what's going on, you need to, you know, meet with disability services, get any testing that needs to be done. So if you need accommodations or things like that to be successful, you work on that. But again, don't ignore it. Don't leave it to the last minute. It's time to handle these things early in the semester. Delaying is not going to make anything better. Yeah, absolutely. Delaying is rarely going to make anything better. And with that, we're out of time. (laughs) (laughs) If you enjoyed this episode of the Law School Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review or rating on iTunes because we would really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any new episodes. We release one every Monday. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to Lee or Allison at lee at lawschooltoolbox.com or allison at lawschooltoolbox.com. Or you can always contact us via our website contact form at lawschooltoolbox.com. Thanks for listening. Good luck turning your grades around and we'll talk soon.